Hello and welcome to the business podcast at Imperial College Business School. I am your host, Amin Siala, and today my guest is Michael Rolf. Michael Rolf is the co-founder and CEO of YoYo Wallet. Uh, YoYo Wallet is the fastest growing and largest multi-retailer mobile wallet in Europe. Uh, it's founded in 2013. Uh, YoYo is now present in more than 500 educational outlets, 300 corporate outlets and 800 high street outlets and has raised a total of 21 million pounds to date. Um, so YoYo for Shoppers is a sleek, easy to use app that allows fast, secure mobile payment, automatic loyalty collection on every purchase. And for retailers, it helps them to identify every customer at the point of sale, turning anonymous shoppers into individuals with purchasing preferences and habits. Uh, from here, YoYo provides a platform to analyze, segment, and engage with customers. Um, the, what's interesting about YoYo Wallet is that um, the first test bed, the first micro environment which it was trialed in, was Imperial. Uh, Michael, thanks for coming. Thank you. So you've uh, founded this in 2013, and how was it that Imperial was the first place you tested this? So that's right. So, well, basically, YoYo wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Imperial College. So I actually met with uh, my co-founders, Alain Felice and, and Dave Nicholson, uh, back in end of 2012, uh, when we were talking about sort of all the world of fintech and more interestingly, what Starbucks had achieved with their mobile payment and loyalty app, which at the time had had reached 10% share of their checkout. Mm. And, and we found that quite interesting that sort of having a payments background and, and certainly a sort of between between the three of us all having sort of payments backgrounds and banking backgrounds, um, that a retailer had come along and been the first to really make a mobile uh, the sort of point of interaction with their customer base. Right. And, and at the time, Alan was actually a venture partner at uh, Imperial Innovations, okay. which is the uh, investment arm, or you know, the investment arm of Imperial College, really, to a degree. Uh, it was at the time, and through that sort of conversation, and you know, sort of talking about, well, you know, what was it going to take to actually go beyond it being sort of something that each retailer goes and builds, and and you know, making mobile payment and mobile loyalty mainstream. You know, what does that need to look like? And you know, clearly, having ideas is one thing, but but going to sort of prove out your idea through a concept is something completely different. And we actually came across to uh, to the guys at Imperial College here at the time in the catering department, um, having been sort of introduced by the, the treasurer at the time, a guy called Peter Midgley, um, to sort of share with them an idea about what we think it will take to, uh, you know, essentially get to know their customers better here on campus and provide a better experience and a, and a better service. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came out of that conversation um, was essentially that, you know, at the time, cash was 92% of all transactions. And, and it, it really was uh, an inhibitor to improving, I guess, the catering experience mm. because... Friction. Friction, exactly. Mm. So we ended up um, sort of going away and thinking, well, you know, as a start point, let's see if we can get, you know, mobile payment and, and loyalty embedded into a seamless experience through an app. And uh, we actually... From that from that first meeting, we're given sort of permission to to try and do that at Imperial College, which was uh, very fortunate. But the ultimate form of MVP, right? You know, mm. Before we'd even done any sort of development work, we had somebody that looked like a customer to us saying yes. <laughs> so, right. so it kind of validated the idea, and and then we went off and we founded the company in in May 2013, and uh, spent pretty much the rest of 2013 raising some money, getting a, a team of people together to to actually then go and you know deliver an app that would work. Yeah. And um, we launched in January 2014 at uh, uh, across the the campus, but um, that was after having gone live doing our first transactions in November 2013 at the Sir Alexander Fleming Cafe, okay. um, which is obviously you know across the way from where we are here in the uh, sort of student union uh, yeah. sort of complex. So we um, we ended up effectively launching uh, in November in a beta program with. 175 users, mm. very restricted sort of controlled beta group. Um, but what amazed us was how quickly we got that beta group together. You know, we literally did that within a within a week. How did you find them? Yeah. Um, we we just put some flyers out at the cafe. Okay, I think more than that. Right. And uh, with that said, you know, here's five pounds if you, you sign up to this app and you use it. And now, how different was it back then? Because I mean, we're recording what we're in May 2018 now, yeah. so mobile payments a little bit more natural. But back then, I don't imagine it was. So, well, this was pre-Apple Pay and pre-Google okay. Wallet as well. So, you know, it's the earliest 
probably the earliest days of, of yeah. mobile payment. Um, I wouldn't say it was that different, right? Mobiles, <laughs> mobiles do did the right. same thing that they did, yeah. uh, they do today, and and people were quite comfortable with the concept that they were more than just a device to have Make a conversation with. Yeah. yeah, so I think the expectation about them doing more was was certainly embedded then. Hmm. Um, I think uh, the fact that we had no problem getting people to become part of the program sort of highlighted the interest. I guess the ex- yes. yeah, yeah. The, more the expectation. I, I I remember actually one of the f- earliest forms of consumer feedback because I spent. When we first launched Imperial, I probably spent six months solid here, and oh. um, you know, literally the company was you know based here. We had a, an office at the an innovation center and, okay. and all sorts, and and the feedback I remember most was uh, there was a, there was actually a, a chap because that I asked why he was using Yo. This was post kind of the full campus wide launch, and the Imperial the, the student union had become part of that program as well. And I just said to him, you know, so so why do you use Yo Yo? And he just well, it's just simple it's obvious you know like and he looked back at me as if say why are you asking me such a stupid question like <laughs> why wouldn't i be using my phone to pay and to get at that point my loyalty and, and to get my receipt yeah i thought well yeah i agree with you why wouldn't you be but i want to know why did what <laughs> you know, yeah but, yeah, but yeah the conversation went nowhere because it was just it was yeah. that's when the penny dropped for me it's, you know we you just made onto something yeah though. i mean yeah. the experience is it's just so obvious I mean, I, I need to share, uh, I guess, uh, make a disclaimer here. So I've started using Yo-Yo Wallet um, from the time I came to Imperial. It captured my interest, like, Yo-Yo Wallet, what is this? You know, it's interesting that it's endorsed by the outlets here at Imperial. And I would probably echo what, what he was saying. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't use it. Super simply, you turn it on, you scan the QR code, your receipt, you can export it in PDF format yeah. if you want, click of a button. Uh, and uh, you get free coffees, you get rewards. It's very easy to claim. And it, it just makes sense. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, say my background is payments background, so Barclay Card, First Aid, to PayPal, and I've always worked within kind of what's known as merchant services, right. so helping retailers take payment or helping merchants take payment from from their customers, consumers, you know, the likes of you and I. And amongst all that, I then spent some time uh, as a founding member of a fintech advisory and investment firm called Anthemus Group, okay. where I did a lot of work with, you know, sort of, you know, even even large scale um, you know, companies like Vocalink and, and Yellow Pages and hmm. Money Bookers, which was now called Skrill, helping them think through sort of, you know, innovation in payments. And one of the things that, that was continually coming up was the concept of sort of digitalization of, of commerce. Hmm. Okay, so again, every year, no one is surprised now when you see that Amazon has, you know, has, I guess, kind of taken an even bigger bite out of the commerce world. Or, or nobody's surprised to see a a high street retailer saying that they're struggling with performance because uh, an online competitor yeah. or somebody that's just, you know... Toys R Us. Yeah, it's a prime... Well, example. Yeah, here's an example of giving Amazon your complete uh, logistical supply chain mm. and, you know, boom. Yeah. You know, within a, within a you know, short space of time, they seem to be selling more toys than you do as a business. So, it's yeah. um, so it's crazy how Amazon can do that very quickly. But when we, we're looking at the experiences of the in-store environment, which... Even though there is, you know, dramatic drive towards digitalization, the reality is, in-store payments and and sort of face-to-face payments still account for roughly about eighty to eighty-five percent, depending on what statistics you you, you go for, mm. of the world's transactions. That's very high. Yeah, so it means super high. I mean, it's you know, supermarkets obviously big driving force of that. But you know, ultimately there is a trend towards digitalization, and, and when we looked at in-store specifically, and you look at those experiences in these certainly fast pace, you know, sort of quick service environments mm. where, you know, everybody has to has to go because you're eating and drinking at least once yep. a day. You know, cash at that point back in 2012, 2013 mm. was still very much a dominant uh, driving force within within that environment. And if you look at, you know, the fact that payment is not broken, and that has always been our belief, payments is not broken, right? If, mm. if technology didn't exist, we'd all still find a way of getting getting by, even if it was a case of exchanging goats or right, right, whatever, right. It, whatever it may be. <laughs> if you've got something I want and you're willing we'll to trade. sell it, we yep. will trade, yep. right? So so fundamentally, that, that's not broken, but there's a lot of friction that goes into that process. And, and when you actually map out in a fast-paced environment, like a catering environment, you know, what it takes to handle cash, actual cost of cash management, which is actually the most expensive form of cash payment, uh, sorry, mm. expensive form of payment any retailer can take and you look at the reason why queues form some of it's to do with capacity the ability to actually produce Mm. a certain amount of product like coffee any one point in time but actually a lot of it's to do with the handling of cash Mm. 
then you take into the fact that it goes missing, you know, whether it's uh, unintentional or, yeah. or, or otherwise. Yeah. Um, then you take into the fact that there's processes like giving a receipt. Mm. And it sounds really, it's really stupid to say this, but I spent, I'm the guy that spent far too much time looking at how these, right. you know, it's like the old time emotion study from back <laughs> in the day and, and looking at it and, and seeing that when somebody puts a receipt and if a cashier has a habit of putting a receipt down in somebody's hand mm. before they put the change in, Mm. And then the sort of the percentage increase of certainty that that change will spill out, which then leads to more time as somebody's picking up their money. Yeah. It's like, I looked at this in so much detail. And all that added together. Yeah. And then you've got your stamp card process. Yeah. And then you've got somebody looking through their wallet to see they actually haven't got their stamp card with them. Yeah. So you combine all that together, That all of that, you know, I call them wrinkles in right. the process. You know, those wrinkles could be ironed out with a, with a better experience. That's what mobile was about for us. Mm. So how do you take care of all of these wrinkles in one fell swoop? And so the whole idea that through Yo-Yo, you could simply, uh, you know, scan your device, scan your phone and within, you know, the space of a contactless transaction. Yep. Not only have you paid, you got your receipt, you got your loyalty, mm. any rewards you were due were delivered to you in the form of a voucher, mm. any offers that are available to you, are, you know, they're there for you to see. The fact you've got a history of, of your spend, you know, all of these uh, experiences have been fragmented historically and we've just simply rolled them up and said, it makes sense that it happens seamlessly as as one interaction. Yeah, and that goes back to sort of you know. So why why is it obvious you use it? Well, as as humans, we're, we're creatures that will continually seek out easier and more frictionless experiences wherever we can, yeah. both consciously and subconsciously. You know, just like water will find the you know the path of least resistance. All right. And and I think that you know very naturally we navigate quite easily to to those new experiences if we find them to be more convenient. So how did it grow? I guess straight after Imperial, I mean, it grew pretty rapidly. How many transactions do you have a month today? Well, we're producing over two, sorry, like two and a half million transactions a month now, growing, you know. This is, are you in the UK? Yeah, Just so, UK? Predominantly, so we're, well, we're, we're in the UK, we're in Ireland, and we're in, in parts of Europe. Um, but, but we're UK focused, I think is probably the, the, you know, the way to describe it. And, and would you agree that fintech's hub is in London here, or? Yeah, I, th I think it is. I yeah. mean, it, financial services for Europe's hub is is very much in London, and you know, Brexit aside, and and how people feel about that, you know, we'll leave that for a different conversation. <laughs> right? but, yeah. but but financial services has been centered in London, which is you know has always historically been one of the the world's great sort of merchant cities. Yep, and so. Fintech very naturally has has blossomed here, um, partly because of that sort of historical base of financial services, but also because the government, I think, did a very good job from a mm. from a PR perspective to to sort of tell the story of financial technology and, and sort of owning that as sort of the entrepreneurial innovation center. Yeah. Um, not just for, for Europe, but for the world. Um, and, you know, so that was that was quite convenient from a yo-yo perspective because naturally we kind of got bucketed into that yeah. as well the environment was ripe you know it was yeah. right time essentially yeah. so i guess you're completely for going cashless then is, is this where you think governments should be headed around the world so uh, is, 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 is cash old is, is it redundant yeah. now yeah i mean cash you know it serves its purpose right but when you look at those purposes primarily a lot of them um you know are are not necessarily for the greater good <laughs> you know? right. that's true yeah. so um if i think that if you have a, a system that is completely digitalized and and you know fair and transparent in certain ways, yeah. then uh, you know the economies tend to thrive better for it. Mm. And in those economies that do not have uh, you know sort of digitalization at the heart of of their sort of direction of travel, you know you can see these are the ones that in these global financial crises have have tended to have more trouble. Uh, getting back on their feet because yeah. a lot of the cash that seems to be in the market is is not necessarily uh, paying back into society in, in the way that you know most people have an electronic form of payment would be. So YoYo isn't just a payment platform, right? There's, there's also the aspect, the, the back end, if you like, where you're interpreting yeah. that data. So t tell me a bit, bit about that. I mean, what kind of data do you look for and how much work do you do with a retailer? You know, do you sit down on a table and have a chat with them how they want to reward the customers? Yeah. Uh, what's the process there? I guess, firstly, it's important to sort of point out what did Yo-Yo do in our, in our early days? So it's right. a very specific conversation I, I recall that I had with uh, with Dave, uh, you know, uh, one of the co-founders, about the concept of um, personal privacy around the fact that as a consumer, you know, you, you are basically 
providing a retailer with you know more knowledge about your behavior than than you would have ever done before right. unless you've obviously part of tesco club card and, and i think it's important to note that not only was starbucks an inspiration but club card was an inspiration mm. for us too because we just found that you know it was the most effective form of marketing that, that had ever sort of existed really so somebody knew who you were they knew what you were buying and therefore they sent you offers that you're more really you know more likely to want to yeah. benefit from um but at the time and the irony being that, you know, as we sit here talking, there's, you know, yet more furor over uh, Facebook's sort of approach to, to data. But at mm-hmm. the time, the, the big issue was that there was a there was a fundamental change in in Facebook's privacy policy. Um, and and I remember having this conversation because it's like the debate we have is that this isn't a privacy policy. This is, you know, essentially, what do you give Facebook for them to be able to go and, you know, provide a better service to their customers? Mm. And you got to remember, that as users of Facebook... That's what we are. We're users. We're not customers. Yeah. The customers of Facebook are advertisers. So the privacy policy is completely, you know, was completely sort of redrawn in a way that made it very uh, much more beneficial in terms of how Facebook provided service to their advertisers rather than to, um, you know, to the, the user. To the user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had this debate. And one of the things that came out of it was that we actually developed from day one something known as the transparency statement. Okay. So firstly, it was... This know, is 2013 or 2014? Yeah, tw- this is 2013. Okay. I think it's really relevant, the dates, because yeah. obviously we've... Uh, yeah. No, it's just, there's a much more focus recently on data yeah. privacy. And it's well, become... that's why I, I kind of thought I'd start with opening yeah. up a little bit on this one, because <laughs> it's very topical at the moment. Very topical, and, absolutely. Um, so so we, we looked at it from that point of view that, you know, we had to be transparent from day one. What will your data be used for and for whose benefit? Mm. Right, Because ultimately, like Facebook, you know, as a consumer, you are a user of a service that is powered by Yo-Yo. Now, whether that's the Yo-Yo app or whether that's a retailer app that's that's using the Yo-Yo platform. And the retailer, you know, or the or the partner, you know, who's consuming our platform uh, through an API yep. is effectively our customer, right? So yeah. so there is a, an implicit quid pro quo here right. that, that we've entered into, which is that we facilitate a relationship between that that either merchant or user of the AO platform and their customer. Right? Mm. And so what we're facilitating is the, the flow of data, but also the flow of remuneration for that data. So in, in the instance that you you described earlier on, how you've been using Yayo, yep. what you've been the beneficiary of is, is you know, a better reward program mm-hmm. effectively. Yep. So many you know, free coffees. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's all good. And you're cool with that. You know, you, you, maybe they do know who you are. You don't even know maybe because huh. um, not many people really look at the T's and C's. And the reality of life is actually they don't know who you are because through Yo-Yo is lo- alongside sort of doing the transparency statement. We also made the decision that we were going to tokenize identity mm. from the get go. Okay. So when you create an account with Yo-Yo, what actually really happens is uh, we we create a user ID for you that obviously we understand and know who you are on our platform. Yeah. But we then create a user ID from a retailer perspective, so that no two retailers could ever put two user IDs together and see. Oh, right. That they're the same person. Interesting. So, so if I, if I used it in two different outlets, they would have different IDs. For or me. two different retailers. Okay. So if you used it at the business cafe here and then you used it at um, Nero, you know, for example. Well, yeah, Nero. Yep. Then you're you're two different people. There's no link. There's no, There's no way link. they could uh, draw There's a no pattern. Link. Yeah, absolutely right. So, but on top of that, if you look at when you transact, I don't know if you've noticed your QR code, but it actually changes. changes every, absolutely, I've noticed that, yeah. Every 30 seconds, right? So that QR code essentially is a 24-digit code, right, that okay. is unique to your device mm. and it's unique to your user ID. So we know when we see that 24-digit code, at, you know, being presented at the point of sale, we know it was you. And that's okay. how we then know because we have a card token on file to go and make a request for the payment. But what's important is what I describe here is when you're transacting, you're actually anonymous. Okay. So there is no personal or financial information that is actually traded at the point of sale between you and the retailer. And then equally, when the retailer is looking at their, uh, you know, back end product we've built for them, which is called Engage, they don't see, um, you know, who it is. They just have a user ID. That's mm. it. It's a customer. Yeah. And and again, very early on, our view is pretty simple. My name, my email, and my mobile phone number. Mm have absolutely zero bearing on a retailer's understanding of me. But what I buy, where I buy it, how frequently I do it, and the type of transaction that I make tells a retailer more about me. So my behavior, my preferences, my my profile. 
and the ability to then segment me alongside other people that may look like me in terms of their behavior preference profile is actually more of value to a retailer than knowing that it's Michael Rolfe and his mobile numbers, you know, one, two, three, and his emails, abc dot, you know, at whatever. So, and the reason why it's more beneficial is because the mobile device itself, you know, if you turn it sideways and look at it, that's your personal letterbox to your eyes. So the concept of having to have a mobile phone number so you can text someone or the email so you can just drop yet another email. It's like, you know, yep. it's junk mail through the old, you know, <laughs> letterbox. And yep. maybe some people listen to this and I can't even old enough to even know what junk mail really was. <laughs> but yeah. I distinctly remember, you know, yeah. 20 years ago, just, you know, the volume of just, just rubbish. random rubbish. That's coming through. That would come through. Everything. And, yeah. and PVC, Windows, yeah. Windows Glass. It's... Yeah, I mean, my email today, even for my email for Yaya, I mean, I, I look at it as being fundamentally broken hmm. because I would say at least 70% to 80% of what I get on a daily basis is not something that I have actively selected hmm. into. Yeah, It's a byproduct of these old email um, systems like MailChimp, hmm. where the minute you unsubscribe from one thing that you somehow unwittingly subscribe to, yep. You know, like a gremlin, five more things absolutely pop up in its place. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So, so we've always felt that that is just not on the side of consumer experience. Do you think a solution is coming for this? You have really touched on a big point there. I mean, I I unsubscribe almost on a weekly basis, and as you see, exactly yeah. as soon as you unsubscribe from one, five more come, and it's uh... so. So I think there will be a solution that comes with, comes down the pipe. I know what you know. Are you working on something? <laughs> I, I feel like this uh, is. Uh... Yeah, I think that um, you know. So GDPR is. Uh, he's probably pertinent to sort of mention this, you know, sort of the, you know, the European sort of Data Protection Act that's come up, uh, which is known as GDPR, which, um, you know, is looking to start to address, you know, sort of the classification of personal data and, mm. and how personal data is used. I think really does sort of speak to a wealth of opportunity to to sort of redefine mm. how people engage with people that look like their customers, people who are their customers, mm. or people who they'd like to be their customers. Mm. Um, if you think about it today, the fact that somebody can go out and basically buy an email list from from anyone that happens to say, I've yep. got a list of emails. Yep. Hundreds of thousands of emails of yeah. males between the age of 18 and 25 yeah. living in Birmingham. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, in itself is is pretty flawed. But as a as a individual, you know, we create relationships on a daily basis. And, and some of those relationships are really pertinent because they're very timely to what we're looking for. Maybe we are looking for, a, you know, yet another new white T-shirt. And, yeah. you know, I want to see what offers are out there. And so I want to be able to subscribe to those yeah. sort of offers. But at, once I have bought that T-shirt, maybe I don't want to get more marketing around buying more white T-shirts. Mm. I want to be able to yeah. sort of dial that down. Yeah. So we do think about yo-yos being that sort of personal remote control to somebody's life as, as we go forward around how you control the different relationships you have with brands and retailers. Okay. And so, you know, I do think that there is a lot more that we can do on the basis that we've, you know, tokenized identity. We've created a, a effectively that portal, that remote you know, portal for, you know, receiving information that, that brands and retailers want to send you. But most importantly, the portal that a consumer can say, I want more, I want less of. Well, today, do you know what? I actually don't want this inbound volume of offers. Mm. I'm not somebody who wants to be bombarded, but what I want to be able to do is just dip into the stream of offers because I'm I'm in South Kensington. It's coming up to lunchtime. Yeah. And I want to see if there's a decent offer at a restaurant around me or whatever it may be. Mm. Can you give us a direct example of someone using this? So how does it look? So if a retailer adopts Yo-Yo, what can he see? And and yep. does he create the offers? Does he come up with the offers? It sounds a little bit complicated. You know, How, how would they determine what to give to who? Yeah, so, you know, since launching here at Imperial College, you know, we've gone on uh, and, and learned a lot around how merchants want to engage with their customers and, and specifically in the food and beverage space. And I think that, you know, to a degree, that's kind of made us thought leaders mm. because one of the things you kind of pick up on is that, you know, not everybody's a marketeer, <laughs> effectively. Oh. What they're more interested in is making sure there's operational efficiency about how they provide the product or provide the service. So, so naturally, we've we've become quite good at sort of understanding how you sort of maximise uh, the user experience around a loyalty program. And I think also what we've done is we've proven that you know when done right, they can be quite effective for um, you know building a better relationship between the, the the retailer and their customer. So, so we we obviously have a, have opinions and we 
and we share those opinions as part of the service with the retailers with the retailers okay. but but ultimately our aim is that what we want to be able to do is, is two things one we've we've done the first one already we've putting the tools into the hand of the retailer where you know within a couple of minutes they can define a, a segment of users they want to to launch an offer to and they can do it and, and an example would be someone like cafe nero who um who recently they launched a new product this was sort of probably around about October last year from memory, but they launched a new product that was called the Cortado. And it was the first product they launched where they actually had uh, an app user base. So at the time, the, uh, the Cafe Nero app that com was completely powered by Yo-Yo um, had 5% share of transactions. Okay. So they did two things. You know, they, they did the usual. They put lots of posters up in store. Cortado, I remember. Cortado, yeah. Had a few. And then if you're using the app, and by the way, you can use your Yo-Yo app at Cafe Nero as well. Okay. Um, so, or you can get the Cafe Nero app and just log in with Yo-Yo. So it's one account, multiple mm. interfaces. But you um, you had a, essentially you had an in-app message. And, and the message was, you know, hey, we've launched Cortado. If you try the Cortado, you get a bonus stamp. So at the time, what was interesting was that 18% of all of those new purchases of a Cortado that happened in that first four-week period came from the app, mm -hmm. right? So 5% of people using the app delivered 18% 18 of, the yeah. of the sales of Cortado. And in fact, still today, 16% of all Cortado sales come from app users, which is, you know, we're approaching about 8 9% of share checkout of And of what does this tell you? I mean, yes, what is the main learning of this then, that, that there is a future for these apps to facilitate sales that increases? Oh, it? yeah, for, without a doubt. I mean, it's the most effective and an efficient form of communicating to a customer, mm. you know, to let them know that there is something new. And and it's it's about reminding them of, of that experience that they had. You know, sometimes it's say, hey, you know, it's been, you know, this is your 30th Cortado since we launched, you know, here's another free one on us. You know, right. being able to do that sort of thing is only possible because of what Yoyo has built. And and we look around the world at what, you know, others in the space we're in, like we know that we've built technology here that's, you know, it truly is, you know, one of a kind. You know, the fact that we have the ability to create these experiences that for the consumer are so simple and so easy and actually really, you know, so delightful to the point where you kind of just, you don't even really sort of have to think about how it works. Yeah. It just works. Yeah. And from a retailer's perspective, a similar thing. It's like, well, actually, you know, that example of the Cortado, it is just one of many. You know, we we did another one around ice drink sales and, and, and actually, interestingly, the time at which we actually launched this campaign kind of feels counterintuitive because it, if you cast your mind back to the news at a certain point in summer last year, there was mm -hmm. a lot of press around what was in the ice okay. of coffee shops. Yep. Um, and I think it's no different if you looked at what was in the ice in, in, in any environment, right? <laughs> so right. I'll let people Google Google what they want ice. from that one. Okay, 2017. The, yeah, right. rather than the and get into it. Okay. Um, but but essentially, this campaign launched and and through launching it through the app again, we, we actually drove ice drink sales by 212%. And it was very simple. What we did is, is well, I would say what we did is, what Nero did is, they gave everybody that had drunk a hot drink a free voucher for an ice drink latte. Mm. Right. So, so firstly, if you think about doing that in sort of the, the real world, it's, you know, you, know, you probably have people come on campus here giving you like free product. Yep. They don't know who you are. They feel good about doing it. They've spent thousands of pounds to do it. Yeah. And at the end of it, they've just given their product to people that are already buying their product, mm. right? Or already tried that product. So it's yeah. like just, you know, things that you can do, e you know, that seem easy in the old world, but actually when you really look at it, feel quite silly to do. Okay. So this ice drink, we actually said, well, look, anyone that's, that's drunk, you know, a caffeine, a caffeinated drink, they got a free voucher. So then we started to see, well, who redeems the voucher and how quickly do they redeem the voucher? Now that in itself is really quite interesting because you start to see the effectiveness of who you've targeted. But what you really want to know is who then went on to display the behavior which you want as your ultimate outcome, which is more, more, you know, purchases, buying more purchases sales, of the, the ice yeah. drinks. Yeah. And so we was able to track this all the way through. And again, it's not that they knew who it was. They didn't know, like Michael was one of the guys that went and did that. I was just one of a segment of users yeah. that actually displayed behavior they wanted to, to in, instill. Mm. And, you know, it's one of the most successful campaigns that, that I think anyone can say that has been run. And we did we did a lot here actually in, in Imperial. We did something with uh, Molston Cause. I can tell you a lot about, you know, how hard it is to give away a free pint of drink to a student, believe it or not. How hard? Yeah. Why is it difficult? 
So if you came back to the old world of how some of these guys would do it, they would come on campus and they'd distribute these vouchers, right? But when are they distributing the vouchers? Probably around about 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning when right. people seem to be around. So people, what do they do? They take a voucher. Oh, yeah, I have that. Then they lose them and mm. they forget about them. Mm. So the time at which you actually want them to have the voucher. 6 p.m. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. So what did we do? <laughs> you know, we, we knew everybody that was, you know, drinking at Student Union. Send them a message. Five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. We sent a message. Hey, you got a voucher for a, for yeah. a free pint of course. Yeah. So we saw that somebody actually redeemed their voucher within two minutes of actually receiving that message. Mm, as opposed to. Boom. Yeah. yeah. And then we obviously then track the behavior to see that actually this had a massive uplift in the sale of cores. And I don't know if you guys are still, you know, drinking cores at the five, six, eight bar here. But I don't think so. Uh, but, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Alex, yeah. Alex knows over here. But uh, I don't think many people were drinking cores, but they did then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of then, 2014, Apple Pay um, yeah. came came around the block. Do you, did you see them as as guess competitors? You know, to be able to pay on mobile. How how different was YoYo? For, well, fundamentally. You know, I think it's in the name, right? Apple Pay, mm. YoYo Wallet. Okay. Right? So the, the the process of payment is one fragment of an overall wallet experience. Okay. Um, so that's important. I think it was actually, we were quite pleased that they came out because, you know, back in 2013, when you're raising a, a seed round and you've got the thought that everyone's got, which is Apple are going to get into the payments and Google are going to get into payments and they're going to dominate everything. And it's quite a tough environment because nobody knew but you had this looming shadow and, mm. and any startup always has this, right? There's always an incumbent somewhere that could be doing it, <laughs> but they're not doing it. Yeah. And and they cast this massive shadow that investors will say, yeah, for that reason, mm. I'm out. And mm. you think, well, you know, it's fair enough. But but them coming to market with what, what, what they have come to market with did us a favor because you just saw immediately what the difference is. You know, with Apple, you're just using a very a much a more expensive device mm -hmm. to pay. Right, so you yep. could use a piece of plastic, cost you nothing, and you know, away you go. Or you can use a, a phone, and you can tap, but but you feel better about it maybe because you feel cool about using your phone, and just as the same. And I recognise this is the same thing with the yo-yo. So it's just there's something cool about using your phone <laughs> to pay, right? Yeah. But but fundamentally, there's no difference, right? Whether it's an Apple Pay transaction or whether it's a contactless yeah. transaction, it's the same. Right. You're still going to get given a paper receipt, and and maybe you're still going to get your stamp card out or your point card out fundamentally they've improved nothing mm. from a user experience point of view and equally from and this is you know both google and apple and samsung just you know making sure i'm not just you know i'm not you know. <laughs> isolating <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. um from a retailer's perspective it's done nothing right mm. it, like they don't know anything more because of the, as a result of it i mean they'll say oh you know transactions but contactless was making transactions faster anyway right so so the only the only ones to really benefit from this whole sort of creation is Apple because they've created yet another reason yeah. as to why your phone should be the center of your life. And mm. and I think that's a good enough reason to do it, by the way, as well. Yeah. Um, and so, the commission they were earning on it as well. I think that's... Well, they got lucky early on in the first deals they did. They actually do make a share of the, you know, they, they get paid for every transaction. But that's, yeah. you know, Google and, and Samsung don't. Mm. So. You know, you can see that Apple in the future won't be getting a, a, a cut of every transaction necessarily, but maybe mm. they will. Maybe they, all three of them will because they do do. I think if the direction of travel, if I'm Visa and Mastercard, is that you know I have to recognise that these devices have become the new issuing platforms to mm. degree, um, and so I think they do need to have to have a, a cut of what's going on and, right. and part of it. But but if you look at it, you know, it comes at somebody's expense, and, and an issuer historically uh, is is your bank. Yeah. Right. So fundamentally. You know, they've been disintermediated through that process because you're not using your contactless bank card where you're looking at your bank logo every day. Now you're just looking at a device that's going, you know, scanning on a on a PDQ. Yeah. So. When it when it came out, we were happy about it. At least we know. Right. Actually, it's very basic mm -hmm. and it's but it's really good at doing this basic. And if you look at what Yo-Yo is again, I mentioned I talk about Yo-Yo as being a platform. You know, Yo-Yo has a platform that has multiple different elements of a transaction experience that it can join together end to end, uh, you know, as part of a, a richer, more consumer engaging experience, mm. which makes it a better experience from a consumer's perspective because we're doing more with that transaction. Mm. And it certainly makes it a, a more um, beneficial uh, form of payment from a merchant's perspective because they start to actually understand who their customers are and, yeah. and what's going on. So 
equally, you know, our job is to just adapt with whatever's going on mm. in the market. And we looked at Apple Pay. So, well, it make perfect sense that somebody could use Apple Pay to pay, but still collect loyalty through Yo-Yo. And if you look at uh, someone like Cafe Nero, for example, you have a loyalty only mode in Cafe Nero's app that you can then basically get a, um, you know, loyalty only uh, stamp voucher yeah. into the Apple Pay wallet, whatever that okay. is called, right? Do many opt for that though? No, very small. I mean, exactly. Apple Pay and, and, and all these they? pays, like, yeah. you know, the reality of life is they're less than 1% of transactions for most merchants. I mean, to be honest, one of the reasons why I, always, why I use your wallet altogether is because I will be rewarded, you know, ultimately. And yeah. if, if I use any other form of payment, then I won't be getting any points, so to speak. However small those points are, it's just human nature, yeah. right? If you could get a deal, if you could potentially be rewarded, then you will just opt out for that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, again, we are at the core, we're very simple creatures. You know, if you're telling me that I can get what I want, but I get more of it, or I get it for less. No brainer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, naturally, I'd like all of that on the spot. I'd yeah. like more, and I would like what I want, and I want more of it, and I want to pay less for it. Yeah. But that's clearly not the right model from a retail perspective. Like you've got to, you know, it's got to be something you earn as well. Yeah. There's got to be some economics behind it, some some mathematics. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but Ivy Publishing actually has a case study on your, your wallet. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did some work with them, I think. Um, now we actually had this in one of my modules. Um, oh, you did. Yeah, we did. Oh, fantastic! And uh, this is one of the reasons why I was looking forward to this actually, because um, it was a cause for debate. But what I said in the lecture when we were discussing this was because I've redeemed a lot of free coffees from Yo-Yo Wallet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ashamed to say it. You know, uh, I thought that if everybody uh, and my cohort has 90 people, if they've all been using Yo-Yo Wallet, and by the way, they buy at least two to three coffees on average every person on a daily yeah. basis. If you think how many times I've been here. The amount of coffees that they could have redeemed mm. is so large throughout the year that it's a no-brainer. It's a win-win, you yeah. know, to, to to use such an app. So this is one of those uh, one of those benefits that I think. Yeah. Um, is this being communicated to the to the end consumer? Because what I'm curious about is, um, do you go out to the end customer and say use your your wallet, or is it the job of the retailer? So it's the it's predominantly the job of the retailer. I mean, one of the things that that we've looked at is. You know, we have a complicated setup when you really boil it down. So from a business case perspective, um, you know, we're a B to B to C. And and in fact, I would I could almost make an argument, you know, for a different business case in the future. OK, what it, you know, we, we've created two companies simultaneously, right, to a degree, because we have an app that's very consumer focused. It's called Yo-Yo and you use it in catering environments yep. like universities and, you know, places of work. You know, so, for example, Visa's head office, head office, they've got three in the UK. Mm. They all accept Yo-Yo. Right. Okay. So so that app is, you know, very much a consumer facing app in closed environments. Yeah. Um, predominantly. But at the same time, you know, we've built this this product called Engage for a retailer that gives them insight into their, their business activity. So, you know, actually in a couple of weeks, it's going to give them real time insight. So, you know, real time there. So you'll be able to sit there as the CEO or as the head of your, uh, you know, the company, whatever it may be. And just you know, look at your dashboard, and it will just be going ka-ching, ka-ching, mm. ka-ching. Because every time you make a sale, you'll see it coming through live on your business pulse. And, oh. and that sounds like well, surely they've got that already, but they you know they really haven't. It's quite a revelation for them. So you know, you've got that for them. Uh, you know, business intelligence within that product. You've also got customer insight. So you've got a loyalty program. Actually, seeing how how your loyalty program performs. Mm. You know, giving giving ROI on your investment, because retail is making an investment. To give you that free coffee, they're making an investment. Absolutely. They're saying, hey, if I give you a coffee every now and again. You'll come back. You'll come back, yeah, exactly. And so we show the ROI on the loyalty program. We then have a marketing module, which is, you know, launch campaigns. And that already does campaign reporting. So, you know, ROI on your marketing. You know, did it drive sales? Yeah. You know, that's ultimately what you want to know yeah. as, a, as, a, as a merchant. Or a now, Yo-Yo, you must have captured so much data, I mean, just from the duration that, that you've been up. Mm. Do, do you package this in a way and give this to retailers? Do you, do you act on a consultancy kind of capacity? So I'd say we're at the very beginning of, of that journey. Um, and it's the right time for us to say now's the time to, to make it more of a focus for us. Yeah, I mean, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, firstly, all of this data has always been there. Right. Okay. And, and it's, so, so if you know, if you believe the economist, data is the new oil, right? And mm -hmm. I think people Absolutely. have been saying that. So, or the new gold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They've been, you know, for the last 15, for 20 sure. years, it's been kind of banded about in those terms. But you know, the way I think about it, like oil, 
all the while it's in the ground, you know, as it were. So data is everywhere, but all the while it's just everywhere. Yeah. There's no value to it. No. Nope. So, you know, to make it something that's truly valuable, you've got to have, you know, the right infrastructure in place to extract it. And you've got to have the right, you know, I guess... Uh, mines, mine, yeah, mine, exactly. exactly. Yeah, you need yeah, the refineries, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, oil. So, we're yeah, in the oil so, uh, metaphor here. <laughs> so, my, mines, refi- yeah, I hope stick with us. <laughs> um, so, but basically, you know, once you've you've done that, the the danger is, and I think Tesco's, as much as I talked about Club Car being an example of an inspiration, they're also a warning, right? Hmm. That you know, analyzing data to the nth degree can make you become quite messy in how you go about things and and ultimately you know you've got to find the sweet spot you know it's like anything like there's a, there's a goldilocks zone where it's just right mm. and you feel that club card stepped that mark yeah i mean if you actually if you look at there's um there's a lot of in, there's a lot of uh you know information out there about just how far tesco went mm. into sort of the mining you know it's like something they identified 2800 and something of different user groups and there's just there's so okay. much going they on. Overcomplicated it. That's what I'm okay. Yeah, overcomplicate the offering, right? And I think at the heart, again, everyone needs simplicity. Right. And I think the way in which you use data, you should always go back to like, just how simple can you make it? And and how simple can, can you make it to consume? So so what we're really focused on is just doing some of the obvious things, but just doing them really well. Um, and, and to not overburden merchants with data and insight just because we can mm. what we want to be able to produce for them effectively is the big green button and that big green button says if you launch this campaign yep. over the next seven days we expect it to return x percent and here's a little lever if you toggle it to the right mm. it will increase the number of people you reach and therefore it'll have this impact on sales and if you toggle it to the left it will decrease it and therefore it'll have this impact on your sales and wow. that is all possible like we can we can do it manually today to start forecasting this stuff. Yeah. But now's the time for us to start to automate that process. And so actually, well, you know, if I look at sort of the open roles that I have at Yo-Yo, I mean, you know, data engineering is, you know, very much becoming sort of that core theme of, of what we're looking at. You know, it's saying taking the data, making it insightful, but more importantly, giving people the tools to do something with it. And the flip side from a consumer's perspective is to just, you know, display something meaningful to you. So, yeah. you know, you know, and I, this is me picking holes in Yo-Yo's own experience today, right? So you, you talk about how many coffees you've had for free. Mm. But off the top of your head, you couldn't tell me how many coffees you've actually bought in the last 12 months. That's a very good point. Right? But the world of quantified self, mm. which, you know, again, that is very much the direction of travel. It be, It's just nice to know. I've spent this much money on coffee. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, and being able to sort of relay that in a sense of like, okay, well, actually, I feel good about the number of coffees. And actually, that's about 20% higher than the average person's coffee consumption. You know, that information is very simple, mm. but it's and it's not necessarily going to do much at, at sort of the point of consumption, but it will impact behavior as you go forward. If you think, well, yeah, maybe I'm spending a bit too much money on coffee and yeah. or actually I'm wondering why I'm struggling to get to sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm in this bracket of people that keeps drinking coffee between yeah. eight and 11 at night. And yeah. it's, you know, should be drinking decaf instead. Yeah. I mean, whatever it may be. So, yeah. But I think. You know, the, the real task to make data the new oil mm. is to go through a refinement process where you learn to package it as a product in a very simple form for both consumers and merchants that, that makes it a value add. Mm. Because, that, you know, it's very easy to say that, you know, something that is to this point in time, it happens to be everywhere, but but isn't really being used in a, in a way that drives benefit uh, in terms of experience. So gamification. Uh, you see gamification as, as the way forward for, for merchants, the relationship that tells a bit about that. Yeah, well, so gamification from our point of view is is more around how you build these experiences that surprise and delight fundamentally. Mm. And and again, if you look at sort of how people spend their time traveling or, you know, again, I mentioned I spent too much time looking at queues, right? <laughs> the reality of what they spend their time in the queue doing, right? Just engage with a mobile device right? all yeah. the time. And, you know, whether you think it's a good or bad thing, the reality is that, as a, as a society now, we have this thing that I believe is called, you know, idle eyeball time. Nobody really feels comfortable just standing and looking. Oh, I feel in awkward the real world, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what do I do now? Yeah. Uh, so, so they want to engage in, in the screen. Yeah. And so a surprise and delight for us is about how you can take the everyday experience of buying something, 
you know, let's stick to the coffee because it's an easy one that everyone understands yep. if you're using Yahoo yeah, Imperial. And and creating this experience that goes beyond the transaction. And so we've done a couple of things since she, since I, I did a blog about this back in... Uh, about 2017, 20, I think. Yeah, about so, last yeah. year. Um, and we actually have released uh, a, a few things that... Oh. Uh, have been in the wild and we've got some really interesting data so the first thing is we, we did a, a christmas we did something that was the called the cracker campaign cracker campaign yeah okay and and through the cracker campaign when you transacted and you bought a qualifying item post transaction you got a notification to say that you've you've got a cracker and that if you want okay. to open it basically you may win a prize or you may not and so if you shook your app or you tapped on the cracker it would open right and it would reveal a prize and that prize was given by the merchant or was given by, you know, a brand that was, you know, incentivizing the behavior they wanted to see, which was, hey, feel good about the fact that you may have just won a free Coke. Right. So effectively, um, you know, we saw mass engagement with this. And, you know, mm. in terms of open rate of that cracker, you know, you're talking like 95 percent. Wow. You know, it, it was insane. People that saw they had the cracker engaged with it immediately. Yeah. And that was interesting is that you know we built the algorithms around how somebody wins right because mm. ultimately there's only a set number of prizes mm. a campaign runs for a certain amount of time and and you need to ensure that you know there's a there's regulation that goes in around sort of these sort of things defined as sort of prize draws sure. essentially that you know the algorithm it's has fair. exactly yeah. it's yeah. fair and and you know people like me who are employees don't have the chance to win anything yeah. etc so we build this algorithm that does all of that but but interestingly when you start to look at the behavior that, that is displayed based on whether somebody did win or didn't win on their first experience, right? This is this is where you know, it's remarkable. okay. Okay, and and if you don't win, if you well, this if you do win, you are eighteen percent more likely to transact the second time. So we saw this okay. with new users that come in, had used YoYo or used a Nero app for the first time, and they engaged with this campaign. And if they won on that first interaction, mm. they were back the next day. Eighteen percent uplift in likelihood. Okay, right. That's significant yeah you know? one in five yeah. yeah super significant numbers and and of course you know the algorithm we can't do it in a, you know so my immediate comeback with that was like well at least make sure everybody wins first yeah, time okay, round. okay but you can't do that so um but it's interesting nonetheless you know that i think uh you know that the reason why everybody likes to game in in today's world in that idolable time is that you know it is the dopamine effect it is the little hit you know mm. i'm not i'm not saying anything that should be you know revealing here because there's enough studies that show that they're little and often, and again, back to the Facebook, why have they designed the platform in the way they've designed it? And yeah. how, the, how likes have, you know, I think become... It's insane. Well, you know, they're kind of a drug for a lot of people, right? It's a drug. I mean, it's just like what Netflix doing, you know, with autoplay. You go from episode three, automatically, less than 10 seconds, it's going to episode yeah. four. And yeah. then on YouTube, yeah, videos autoplay. Yeah. So it's constantly keep you yeah. engaged. It's exactly. incredible. Yeah, so, so dopamine has, uh, has a big effect. And... You know, it's how we kind of use that, I think, responsibly in the context of, of transaction experiences at Yo-Yo that we've, you know, we found that it's it's quite interesting. But it, yeah, people feel really good about it. I mean, it's, you know. It works. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what McDonald's doing with their Monopoly? I mean, that, that's a form of gamification, yeah. right? Well, they've been doing that for, for years. And and I just think it's pretty archaic that you still got to collect these things off a... Right, cup. physically. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. Yeah, it's bizarre to me that they haven't found a way to digitalize that process and... The reality is, I'm sure they'd go and spend a lot of money trying to find a way to do it, but but no one's going to download a McDonald's app just to do Monopoly. It's got to be part of an end-to-end -end experience. With McDonald's. In fact, if anyone knows anyone at McDonald's, tell them to come talk to Yo-Yo because <laughs> you know we could we could make that a far better experience than it is today. Because you got to think how many people actually are really if it's something they feel really good marketing. Mm. But if you then start to really look at the numbers in any meaningful way, if you could look at the numbers, you can't at the moment, right? Yeah. No idea how many are appealing yeah. them, how many aren't. Exactly, how many appealing them, how many, how many people that are appealing them and then losing them, and yeah. it's like it's just a, it's, it's, everything it's about small, it, it's tiny, is broken. But it's a marketeer's dream, right? Because it's a very simple message to communicate: monopoly, yeah. at McDonald's, win, yeah. win, yeah. But but I guarantee you, it's not really doing much. That, that anyone can really sort of say with certainty, this is this is actually delivering sales to the bottom line or mm. customers feel f so much better about it. All it tells you is people would do simple things. If you make it easy for them, why wouldn't they do it? I mean, yeah. I don't play Monopoly for McDonald's, but if I've had a McDonald's with Monopoly's on, of course you rip it yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> Only natural. I didn't, yeah. me, I didn't buy more fries because of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so, um, so Pokemon Go, you referred to that as well. Did, yeah. Do you think that really kick-started the, the conversation about this the kind of... 
Well, I, I think what it it shows again is that well, for me, Pokemon Go is more about how you can, you know the augmentation of reality mm. uh, and gaming and and what that was able to do and and the fact that people were were very willing to sort of get out and, and try something that was a bit of you know it was a there's quite a bit of hysteria around it at the mm. time, right? Hype. So, it was exactly, new. Yeah. So so I think that's obviously got a lot to be said for it. Uh, it'd be interesting to actually I should probably look up to see how the uh, the numbers are doing on that now, but. You know, I think I think again. It just all it shows is that the screen of a digital device, you know, is almost symbiotic now with with the human body, mm. and that you know you've got a way in which you can you know craft experiences with the world, whether that's through augmented reality like Pokemon Go or uh, you know through you know the, the simple delivery of a Christmas cracker or an Easter egg, like you know we just did the Easter campaign as well, same thing. Okay. And and people will engage because it's there and it's in front of them. Yeah. And if you compare that to how the world is still working predominantly for most marketeers, which is, you know, an email into an inbox, a letter through a letterbox. Mm. You know, it's just archaic and there's no way in which you can track and understand how you make better experiences from that. You just yeah. do more of the same and you hope it sticks. Yeah. But what we've shown, if you embed these type of experiences and principles around gamification into experiences as part of a transaction or post-transaction or pre-transaction, yeah. you can, and actually through Yo-Yo, you get all of the insight back in terms of the data, you can craft better experiences from that. And it's it, it's and interesting because there's some companies that um, do not do TV advertising because they simply say we can't track the results. We have, do not have the metrics to measure how successful yeah, it was. So that, they just opt out. Yeah, the famous saying, right? I know 50% of my advertising works. I just don't know what 50%. Right? And so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's been around forever as a, an old adage. I can't remember who yeah. said it now. But, you know, kind of that, that saying was kind of a driving principle for Yo-Yo. You know, we want to be able to say at Yo-Yo, 100% of my marketing works mm. and we know exactly how. Yeah, because I've got the data right <laughs> yeah. here. I can, I can show yeah. you the purchases in real time. Yeah. What they bought, how much they bought it for, when, where, and it's yeah. actionable. So speaking of payments then, um, you've worked for PayPal um, and a variety of other payment-related companies. And right now, another topic called topic is cryptocurrency, yeah. Bitcoin. Um, is Yo-Yo looking into this? So, you know, like most people, right, I, I read as much as is out there. Um, and, and I've got a few interesting thoughts. So I think, so separate firstly, Bitcoin and blockchain. Yep. Right. Fundamentally, Absolutely. I think it, kind of we all understood enough to know that's, the, you know, the first thing okay. to do. Currency, um, yeah. infrastructure. So, different. so my personal things around Bitcoin are very varied at the moment. Um, I, I think what they've done is provide it's provided a, a route to, you know, bringing some, some money into the, into the world that perhaps previously was was not so readily able and available in the world and yeah. there's actually there's a really good blog post by um one of the uh, early uh, ceos of paypal i can't remember the name, brian somebody i can't remember his name now but yeah. it was on uh I'll, it will come back to me and yep. I'll, I'll, I'll piece post it on um that he basically made the argument that you know bitcoin is you know just a complete and utter sham mm. and um it's, what year did he make this claim in Oh, he's made this literally. This was a very recent post. Okay, like, 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like a month ago. Not okay. even a month ago. Last week I read it. Okay. Um, and and that essentially it's great for criminals, right? So that's the summation of his, okay. of his post. And I think there's lots of people that would say yes, it's done. Many that. would agree to that. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. and there's also obviously a lot of speculators out there saying no, it's great. It's, it's just a commodity, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, and you know, penny stocks were commodities too, right? And it didn't stop a lot of people losing money that didn't know enough about it, right? So yeah. so I'm I'm a little bit. You know, the personal on the side, okay. mm, I'm on the fence on it. Blockchain, however, you know, the theory of it, I think you've got to be crazy to say that, that it's not yeah. something, yeah. there's not something there. Mm. However, at the moment, it is a solution looking for a real problem, right? Okay. Okay. So if you think about, well, where is it meaningfully being applied apart from into a cryptocurrency set? Mm. You, you kind of go, yeah, well, there's lots of things you could do. Right. You could basically put everything on the blockchain, you know, every industry, it's all going on the blockchain. But, yeah. But, Okay, but where where are we now with it? And so, if I look at you know you know the fact that it's about tokenization, it's obviously decentralization. And I look at what we've done at YoYo. I think there's two things that make it really interesting from our perspective. So, firstly, you know we have a tokenized system, right? Every transaction, you know, is tokenized, mm. and and we know with certainty that transaction happened from this device at this time. And we can look at all the data that was associated with that transaction, right? Mm. So without using blockchain, 
without using blockchain, right. okay. <laughs> uh, which is quite an important point. That's it. And, um, you know, and we're centralized, right? Because, yeah. you know, we're also protecting some of this data and we're also, providing service. Data, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. The second thing I find quite interesting from our point of view is that, you know, we are working in a currency space outside of how you pay. Right. You, know, you think about the fact that on your Yo wallet now you've got stamps and you've got points. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a form of currency. Yep. You know, they happen to be a currency that only work with a particular type of retailer, but they're a form of currency. currency. So it's quite conceivable to say that Yo-Yo could at some point in the future, if it wanted to, say, well, actually, we're going to go out there now. Because if you look at the likes of Air Miles and, and Avios mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Amex and say... They've been doing it for years. Yeah, but but they're all kind of sort of falling by the wayside to a degree that mm. the world is kind of missing a global um, ubiquitous reward currency Yeah, that is interchangeable. You know, perhaps that could be something we could do. Yeah, well, there are some statistics. I think, is it Wells Fargo, if I'm not mistaken? Um, they plucked out some data recently about how many unredeemed um, currency yeah. they had, you know, so points that they would have rewarded the customers. Yeah. And it, and it was in the billions. Yeah. People did not claim these back when you add them together. I would have thought it had been in the trillions more than the billions. Trillions. Yeah, I mean, you know. And again, I, I believe Yo-Yo potentially is, is a way to actually allow people to redeem those offers. Because once oh. you redeem an offer, you'll come back again. So so we see, if you take a, an average stamp card program, there is a 97% redemption rate on the vouchers that are associated. 97? 97%. Wow. So But we've built almost, experience where it makes yeah. it obvious to, you know, yeah. once upon a time people lost them or... They forgot about their account, or it's, you know, okay, it so wasn't easy to, to manage. 97% currently in Yo-Yo compared to the current retail. So if it was a, a card, a stamp. I just don't know. I mean, how many of those stamp? And the stamp, there's more retailer, there's evidence from retailers that run stamp card programs that are pulling them because they've started to figure out that actually they're just used massively for fraud. I mean, there's a couple of cases with retailers that I know about, I won't yeah. mention names, yep. that they actually did a study and they figured out that 15% of all of the things they were giving away for free <laughs> were the result of fraudulent uh, <laughs> uh, stamp vouchers. Right. And it's, uh, you know, not, not they weren't big, the big retailers or yeah, yeah. Of, uh, yeah. you know, localised retailers. Yeah. Well, Michael, um, I guess w one final thing. So, you know, you're an entrepreneur. Um, Yo-Yo was extremely successful so far. Uh, you've been running for how many years now? It's 2018. So yeah, year, they were into year five, I guess. Yeah, so you're in year five. Uh, your latest run is a Series B. Um, you've got a phenomenal team by the sounds of things. I guess, what tips do you have? I mean, uh, when when did you know it was right to, to start jumping into this? Was it the fact that you saw the opportunity uh, and, and went for it? Or did you always want to get into the space? Um, so I think, uh, I don't think you ever can say that you know the answer, that the timing was right or that, you know, everything you're doing was going to be right. You know, hindsight tells you that you've got some things right and, and obviously right. something's wrong. Um but I think if you're going to start something, the, the 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 only thing that you've got to really have is belief. You've got to believe that more things are going to go for you than are going to go against you based on the ideas and, and concepts you have. And so, you know, if you don't have that, then it's definitely not the right time mm. to start. And, you know, if you don't have that belief, it doesn't mean somebody else wouldn't and, and they can go on and prove it. So so when again with Yo-Yo, when, when we started this thing, the biggest thing that drove me was fear because I believed that the world would be centered around mobile interactions you know i didn't you know back in 2012 even before that when i was at pay I was like this is the direction yeah. of travel it's undeniable it's bound to happen yeah so the worst thing that can happen actually from my point of view would be having had ideas all along the way I and mean, I've, I've got my notebooks back from you know 2008 2009 really? where wow. i can keep them well yeah i can see i can <laughs> see the you know the different meetings i've had and i've just you know put things down on paper and i was like do you know what? It would really, really, really suck because if like, you know, I got into my career and I and I saw somebody come along and they built a fantastic company and they yeah. everyone did really well and everyone had a great time and I wasn't part of that because I didn't I didn't do something about it. How useful was your experience before Yo Yo to 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 shed some light on, on the vision, I guess, moving forward? Well yeah, I mean, you know, if I wasn't in the payment space before, I I don't think I would have woken up and right. just gone, do you know what the world needs? Because I think a lot of people did wake up and go, you know what the world needs? It needs a mobile wallet. It needs a mobile payment. It needs a mobile... But I think having the industry knowledge and the industry experience has been super critical. That's what I'm trying to get to here. Uh, I just Do we see a lot of entrepreneurs nowadays that are just jumping straight into the deep end without any knowledge? I mean, how critical yeah, is it to accumulate that knowledge? Yeah, of course you do. I mean, 
I think, I think there's two reasons for that. So f- firstly, the sort of popular zeitgeist is that if you look at everything that comes over from the West Coast, mm. you know, the stories about entrepreneur about entrepreneurial endeavors, Apple, yeah. Facebook, yeah. Microsoft, They're black swans. Well, yeah, yeah, a- yeah, absolutely. Statistically, they absolutely are, mm. and yet the airtime they receive pollutes so many people. They think, you know, what? Well, well, you know, hey, I'm a young kid that maybe yeah. I think I'll drop out of college and, you know. <laughs> Become the next Steve yeah. Jobs. Now, by the way, you know, that could still be the right answer and, and go do it if that's mm. what you really believe in something. But it's also okay to realize that actually there, there are so many types of businesses that, that form somewhere between an Apple and Facebook yeah. and, and failure. And and so, you know, I think trying is, you know, is all part of it back to like, you know, what you need, p- the perseverance. If you are going to do something, belief that you're going to make it work, but perseverance throughout all the tough times because one thing's for sure going in and getting a job and getting paid regularly mm. there's a lot to be said for that absolutely right and so you've got to decide what type of person you are in terms of how comfortable with the risk of not getting paid regularly mm. when you start when you start something but but i do think that the second part is that you know as a as an economy and as almost as a society we're starting to say well look the world is dramatically changing around us because of the digitalization uh, and and sort of how consumer technology has evolved that it's not so clear that these old sort of traditional industries that have been responsible for, um, I guess, employing masses of the population mm. are necessarily going to look the same in the next 10 years, certainly not the next 20, and they're not, you know, next 50, the world is different, completely different place to yep. what it's been. So the pace of change is getting to such an extent. So, so encouraging these can-do, go-make-something-happen mindset I think it's kind of permeating, which is why you do see a lot more now that there are more entrepreneurs coming to the forefront. You know, the access to capital has never been so great. And you've got, you know, partly the financial crash 2008 to thank for that. Oh. And the, the printing of, you know, Gosh. money that yep. essentially comes through the financial services system and distributes into investment vehicles. So, you know, there's a lot going to say that, that you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to give something a go, now there's no there's no better time than now. Mm. On the point of access to capital, how was your experience in terms of raising funds? I mean, where, where did you go to? Who did you approach? So, um, everybody. Okay. <laughs> That's a quick no, and simple answer. Yeah, no, we, um, no we, we, we're pretty targeted. I think we're quite lucky in a sense that so my uh, co-founder's background, Alan, you know, he had an uh, investment background and as mentioned, he was a venture partner in Imperial Innovations. Yep. Imperial Innovations, um, kind of took a look at the, the three of us, myself, Alan and Dave, and, and sort of, you know, thought, well, look, these three guys, they're saying they want to do something. Yeah. You know, they've got background that says they kind of know what they're Kill doing. Kill a team. It yeah. Was three people from the payments industry. Yeah. You had years of experience with you, and it was the right time in 2013, 2014. Yeah. I mean, there's no guarantees, right? But yeah. I think that's the thing. It's it was a pretty good shot. Yeah. It's a, yeah <laughs> they're always a punt, right? No matter how you rationalize them. <laughs> See, it's a risk. They're always a punt, right? We'd never worked together before. That's the risk. Yeah. So um, so that kind of happened where they said, look, you know, why don't you take your idea? Imperial said, yes, make it make it a concept. Show you can do X, Y, Z. And, and so we did that. And while we did that, um, you know, I actually hadn't committed in my mind yet that I was going to go full into yo-yo. Really? Yeah, so I, you were working back then? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I was I was still, um, you know, I was still at Anthemus. I'd actually signed a, a contract to go and be head of Europe for Braintree. Braintree, which is huge now. Yeah, it's part of PayPal. Yeah. They got bought out. Yeah. They oh, got a crazy amount of money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good exit. Yeah. Good exit for okay. Braintree. Um, but at the time, you know, I kind of, and I was, I did a lot of M&A work at, at Anthemus, and so I kind of caught wind of the fact that they were trying to recruit me as head of Europe to tell the, here's our Europe story. But at the same time, a sale was imminent. It was either going to go to Square or it was going to go to PayPal. And okay. I thought, you know, I don't left PayPal. I don't want to end up with PayPal. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so that that was quite quite good, really, because it was like, yeah, you know, this yo-yo thing's going. And Alain did a very good job of saying, you know, it's now or never type thing. Yeah. So we ended up, um, you know, jumping into yo-yo, you know, all of three of us two-footed and, and you know, I went out and spoke to lots of people and and Alan and Dave went out and spoke to lots of people and we yep. we clubbed together, I think, a pretty significant angel investment network around us alongside Imperial Innovations. Um, you know, one of the sort of the first angel investors into yo-yo uh, was the, uh, due to my brother-in-law, mentioned to, to his boss, um, you know, hey, you know, there's this idea swelling around. He said, oh, I'd like to meet him. And I, you know, I rock up thinking, um, 
I'm just going to you know talk Shut to somebody up. about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, literally, and said, okay, I'm in. I'll give you fifty thousand pounds. Wow. And so I walked out with money, thinking, well, I'm not even sure I'm going to do this yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's giving me money. And, and um, you know, so we, we were lucky. And I've got a lot of uh, between all of us, we have a lot of ex colleagues and bosses that, that was part of those early rounds that we did. Amazing. So finally, where should we expect uh, to see Yo-Yo heading? What's the future for Yo-Yo? So we're um, we're obsessed about fixing one of the biggest complaints that we have from uh, our users, actually. And if I was to look statistically at the number one reason people, um, you know, have a have an issue with Yo-Yo, it's because they can't use it in more places. Mm, true. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> which is it's good and bad. It's, it's, know, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Effectively, we're, we're super focused on making sure now that, you know, 2018 is the year that we we really start to show that you can use Yo-Yo in more places in the high street. Okay. And so we obviously started that process with the likes of a Cafe Nero and Harrison Hall and, and Planet Organic. And we've, we've really shown that this, from a retail perspective, has a lot of value for them in the high street. And we have a raft of more sort of quick service restaurant environments that are coming up, um, you know, over the next, uh, you know, next three to six months as we start to sort of really... Uh, you know, roll out. And then the other the other side to it is, you know, again, back to the fact that Yo-Yo is a platform. We're, we're not obsessed about it being a Yo-Yo app. We're obsessed about it. We're obsessed about it being a Yo-Yo powered experience, which means that you should expect to see Yo-Yo. Mm. Engine. Wallet, yeah, right. and the engine, yeah, embedded into other type of apps. And if you think about, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about how banks are being disintermediated. Mm. And, and the fact that you've got, you know, essentially only three reasons to use a banking app. Firstly, it's to check how much money you haven't got. Because if you've got money, nobody checks their bank account, right? Very, very true. So so <laughs> that immediately leads to the second reason to use a banking app, which is to say, well, have I been paid? Yeah. <laughs> and and the third is, well, you know, now I've been yeah. paid, yeah. I better send someone some money. Right. So, but apart from that, there's not really anything delightful about using your bank app. No. And and yet everyone has one. Mm. It's um, a necessary evil. Exactly. <laughs> so we kind of want to take the, you know, the evil part away and make it a necessary delight yeah. by embedding yo-yo experiences into those bank apps. And, and that is something that I'd expect to see over the next sort of six months or so. Some very interesting announcements coming out uh, from us around certain partnerships that we, we could be doing that, that sort of embed those experiences. Sounds very exciting. Um, the, your website is Yo-Yo Wallet. Yep, yoyowallet.com. Yoyowallet.com. I think you're on uh, all the social media for people yep. to, to stay in the loop. Well, Michael, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation. Uh, I think uh, what's happening with you is an exciting case in itself, uh, disrupting a huge industry. And uh, there's just so much to learn from it. And uh, yeah, and uh, I guess thanks for creating it. I've been uh, benefiting from it big time. <laughs> and so have many other people and hopefully many more to come. So that was an episode of the Business Podcast with Michael Rolf, uh, co-founder of Yo-Yo Wallet. I was your host, Amin Siala. Thanks a lot for watching or listening. Uh, stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed on SoundCloud, YouTube, and on iTunes. Uh, take care and uh, keep your eyes open for, eyes and ears open for uh, many more upcoming episodes. Take care. Bye-bye.